we'll start. Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Antara, and today I have with me Kalash Abhinav and Nivedan, and we're undergrads at Pitspilani Hyderabad, and part of the SETS chapter there. This is PARI, our payload for the year 2021. PARI stands for Payload for Antibiotic Resistance Investigation. It also means fairy in Hindi. You may be asking why we've chosen antibiotic resistance as the focus of the payload. We believe wait, it has wait. immense... Sorry, it also means what in Hindi? I didn't catch that. A fairy. Oh, wait, think of that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, right, got it, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You may be asking why we've chosen antibiotic resistance as the focus of the payload. We believe it has immense relevance for research on Earth and future implications for aerospace. 2.8 million cases of antibiotic resistant bacterial infections happen every year in the United States. And that number is likely higher in developing countries like India. Understanding the mechanisms and influences of such an effect is thus crucial. And we all know that current biological problems on Earth are the future problems of aerospace, and it's important to be one step ahead. The current artificial space environment and the fact that astronaut immunity is weakened or dysregulated in space increases the likelihood and severity of an infection. And yes, it is possible for these infections to occur. Along with three new species, Metallorubrum rhodesianum, a gram-negative soil and water microbe has been isolated from Earth return surfaces from the ISS. Soil and water are hot spots for antibiotic resistance genes and horizontal gene transfer events. So it's not inconceivable that the same bacteria or even similar ones may develop resistance and be carried along to space along with potential pathogens. In fact, opportunistic pathogens belonging to Staphylococcus, uh, Pantea, and Bacillus genera have also been found on the ISS surfaces, but this is due to the fact that these microbes are associated with the human microbiome. Given that more and more people are going to space every year, it's important to investigate the implications of such an event. Next slide. Coming to the influence of metals. The interaction of metals and metal resistance genes with antibiotic resistance is an exciting and developing area of research. There exists strong evidence for the co-selection of antibiotic and metal resistance genes in vivo. Co-occurrences have been found across several countries and multiple years linking metal contamination with ARGs. For example, zinc has been found commonly with tetracycline resistance, copper with sulfonamides, and several more. For example, uh, metal resistance and antibiotic resistance have some shared mechanisms of dealing with these stressors. Efflux pumps and reduction of uptake of these toxins by the modification of membrane proteins do exist. Knowing that these complex linkages occur in vivo, it's important to understand the direct correlations between metals and antibiotic resistance expression. Next slide. For this experiment, we chose K12 strain E. coli. It's easy to work with and its rapid growth enables us to get the long growth we need in our petri dishes. The strain is non-pathogenic and the popularity of its use ensures its availability. We will be testing the antibiotic resistance of this E. coli post-transformation with PBR 322, the vector construct, which codes for ampicillin and tetracycline resistance. Next. Of these two, Pari chose ampicillin, a common broad-spectrum antibiotic. Tetracycline was rejected as it complexes with aluminum, which we will come to in a bit. It works by inhibiting transpeptidase, an enzyme required for bacterial cell wall synthesis. The sidal effect is due to the causation of cell lysis that occurs after binary fission. The daughter cells cannot synthesize their cell walls. We will be using a standard 50 microgram per ml concentration of ampicillin in media as a basic transformation selecting concentration. In order to have an observable gradient of inhibition, we chose to include filter paper antibiotic discs on top of the media to stretch the range from 50 to 90 microgram per ml. This was done taking into consideration that the minimum inhibitory concentration of E. coli has been observed experimentally up to 128 microgram per ml for ampicillin. We used this disc method rather than to increase the dissolved concentration of antibiotic in the media, as it would be a fail-safe to ensure that we can test the antibiotic resistance against higher concentrations without killing all the bacteria in the sample from the time the payload is assembled to recovery and incubation post-flight. Next slide. Coming to the selection of metal, we chose aluminum for the metal ion for this payload. Aluminum alloys are widely used in aerospace applications, and hence understanding the effects of contamination by the same is very useful. We've even used aluminum alloys in the construction of the outer frame of our payload. Aluminum concentrations between 0.1 to 1 microgram per ml are the toxicity range for E. coli. However, we wanted a concentration that would be realistically achievable. 
The sun facing side of the International Space Station has been known to reach around 120 degrees Celsius, for which a corresponding leaching concentration for aluminum is found to be around 0.5 microgram per ml. To maintain a low level stress on these microbes so that they are not killed, and making allowance for the fact that aluminum would be present as an alloy, a 0.4 microgram per ml concentration was chosen. Next slide. Now that we've talked about the rationale behind the various aspects of this payload's design, let's talk about the experimental design. Our payload consists of two sets of five petri plates each. The construction of these plates and their canister will be elaborated upon later. The plates are made with standard Luria Bertani nutrient media with 1.5% agar with a dissolved ampicillin concentration of 50 microgram per ml. In one of these sets of five, 0.4 microgram per ml of aluminum 3 plus ion is added in the form of aluminum sulfate a stable and water soluble salt. Antibiotic discs of 10, 20, and 30, 40 microgram per ml are added to four or five plates for an effective range of, five, uh, of 50 to 90 microgram per ml. These serve to compare the joint effects of spaceflight and metal contamination versus spaceflight alone by observing the zones of inhibition of bacterial growth. Next slide. Result expectations. After recovery, the 10 payload petri plates would be incubated along with the controls overnight at 37 degrees Celsius. This experiment uses a modification of the minimum inhibitory concentration test. Instead of having no growth beyond a particular concentration, we used antibiotic discs to measure the changes on the zones of inhibition instead. In this diagram, we see the white antibiotic soaked disc at the center of the plate, the yellow clear region where we see the LV media, and the gray regions of bacterial growth. Next slide. Outcomes. A decrease in a clear zone of inhibition across all concentrations would imply that the shocks and or metal contaminations experienced by this payload caused an increase in the antibiotic resistance expression. Rather, it made them more hardy. An increase in the clear zone would show uh, inversely that the shocks weakened the bacterial antibiotic resistance. Based on literature review and reading experiments of the past, we expect to see an increase in the antibiotic resistance expression. If carried out, Pari could give us the following results. The effect of acceleration and velocity shocks. By comparing the zones of inhibition of ampicillin only plates of ground control and the payload plates, we could tell us it could tell us how exactly the antibiotic resistance has been modified by spaceflight. The effect of metal contamination. By comparing the zones of inhibition between ampicillin only and ampicillin plus aluminum plates in both ground and payload, this could tell us uh, how metal contamination alone has affected them. Now coming to the joint contribution of both spaceflight and metal contamination. By comparing the zones of inhibition of the ground control ampicillin plates and the payload ampicillin plus aluminum plates. Next slide. And why does this experiment make sense to fly on a sounding rocket? For one, exposing live bacterial cultures to vertical acceleration and velocity shocks is not achievable on a ground laboratory. Centrifuges only provide radial acceleration, and in most cases, higher accelerations lead to cell lysis. This payload could be one of the first to demonstrate an accurate correlation between these factors to provide unique and direct insight into the interplay of multiple stressors, and that to a combination which would likely be an important threat in the future. To the best of our knowledge, such an experiment has not been carried out before, and the results could be invaluable for research and for aerospace. Uh, now, Kala should take over and go over some of our structural design. You're muted, Kalash. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. Yeah, go thank ahead. you. Sorry for the interruption. Um, at first, our original intentions were to have the electronics bay between the two parachutes of the recovery model. But that left us like two places for the payload that was near the motor or near the cone. Near the motor, it would be highly unsafe for the experiment, uh, experiment, both in terms of vibration and both structure of failure. So keeping it near the nose cone was the obvious, obvious choice. A second, another possibility we had was keeping it in the drogue compartment, but that would need like additional recovery pressure forces in the compartment and extra constraints on pa parachutes and shock cords. Next slide. Our payload model is 200 and 200 millimeters in height and uh, has a diameter of 135 mm. It weighs around 9.5 pounds and 9.25 pounds and 4.2 or 4.2 kil uh, kilograms. Um, we use standard size um, petri dishes, which are 100 
millimeters in diameter and they are made of polycarbonate. Um, the payload was desire, designed around the diameter of the Petri dishes so as to observe the full range of the inhibition zones and thus we were unable to incorporate the standard CubeSat dimensions. Next slide. The height of the Petri dishes are trimmed down to 8.5 millimeters for proper stacking and ensuring the standard volume of the culture is accommodated. Um, the standard diameter of the Petri dishes allows us to like, you know, properly observe the zone of inhibition. The, we have also installed a um, certain locking mechanism with the Petri dishes to, and also a um, rubber gasket to make it airtight. The internal volume comes out to be 61.5 milliliters, which allows us uh, around 20 to 25 milliliters of culture media to be added, which allows like sufficient aeration. Next slide. The Petri dishes are then placed into a rack, into a cylindrical rack actually, with slots so that uh, we can fit all the, all the 10 uh, Petri dishes in. The rack is then covered with a shock absorbent layer of polyurethane or you can use sorbethane too, that braces the payload from impact during liftoff and landing. The rack and the canister are made up of an aluminum alloy, which is very good in strength to weight ratio and along with the great formability and weldability. Next slide. The electronics casing, which houses the PCB and battery is then inserted on top of the rack and then in, uh, it is enclosed with a cap made of stainless steel. Finally, the canister is then wrapped with a sheet of Kevlar 49, which has very good in insulation properties and also is fire resistant, thus protecting the payload from external factors. And we use so many in insulations to make sure that we are prepared for a realistic scenario, keeping in mind that the, at the time that we would be required to recover the rocket and we wanted to maintain the temperature of the dishes below 40 degrees Celsius. And um, I'll be handing it over to Nivedan. Yeah, so uh, you can see the payload exploded view. Uh, that thus I'm highlighting everything that Kala said. So again, we use a bunch of insulation to make sure that the cultures are maintained at a uh, uh, desired uh, temperature level that's below 40 degrees Celsius. Because beyond that, they would risk being uh, uh, destroyed. And uh, uh, yeah, so uh, this is the entire exploded view of the uh, payload. We also have a certain level of tolerance when we try to fit it within the rocket itself. And we also suspend it in a layer of foam in order for it to snugly fit. So uh, overall, uh, we make sure that uh, the amount of vibrational load that this payload would face is as low as possible. For us to check it, because we cannot do physical demonstrations, we try to run numerical simulations on it. So we ended up doing a modal analysis. So the idea behind the model analysis was to characterize the dynamic characteristics of mythical components. And we did exactly that by performing an NVH analysis. So we performed the model analysis for the payload casing and we found frequencies of six principal modes with a minimum frequency in the order of 1500 Hertz to maximum of 3000. Uh, with the values that we got, we were able to ascertain the fact that uh, there will be no chance of acoustic resonance, hence uh, there will be less damage as such. We also understand there are places where large stresses are produced, but we are sure that they will be directed onto the Kevlar sheet, which also has a very high yield strength in the structure and thus trying to protect uh, the payload properly. Um, so this is the last part, uh, the payload electronics, and this will be taken by Abhinav. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, am I audible everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. So the electronics act as a supplement to the payload itself, and it helps with, it consists of a microcontroller unit with several other sensors and all of it is now mounted onto a PCB. And these sensors help in identifying the conditions this payload might be facing on flight. So the sensors basically include uh, a pressure sensor, a barometric pressure sensor, and an accelerometer and finally another module an sd card module for logging now uh, we have kept in mind to uh, keep these electronics or rather to prevent the intrusiveness of dealing with electronics in the payload so we have kept it at the top of the payload and also the sd card module can help us easily retrieve the data without having to disturb the rest of the casing or having to un uh, uninstall 
the uh, PCB from the payload casing and etc. So uh, the electronic components themselves are basically a TNZ 4.0 and uh, BMP280, which is not only a barometric pressure sensor, and but it's also a temperature sensor. And now the reason uh, we need pressure as well anyway is because even though the payload is designed to be airtight, things could go wrong. And when things go wrong, it's better that we log it, it's better that we record it and report it to make sure that uh, you know we can deal with it later on. And uh, the temperature obviously uh, helps us with uh, ensuring that the uh, bacteria was under the controlled uh, temperatures in throughout the entire duration until the recovery. Now the MPU 6050 is uh, an acceler it's an accelerometer come with gyroscope. And this accelerometer not only helps us detect the shocks and accelerations and velocities uh, in, in, in experienced by this uh, payload, but also helps with the event detection. Uh, like for example, when the rocket launched, when it reached Apogee, when it landed, when did we start recovering it and so on and so forth. And all of these are logged at a constant rate to the SD card module so that we can check it at any time. And that's about yeah. it for the electronics, yeah. Yeah, so um, that's about it for the entire demonstration of the payload. Uh, we'd be happy to answer the questions now. All right, nice job guys. Um, I just had a question back on your uh, on your thermal. So you, you want to keep the uh, the payload below 40 C, so that's 104 uh, Fahrenheit. So if you're yeah. in, have you done a thermal analysis to know if you're if you're sitting in a 114 degree New Mexico weather with a solar load on the on the outside of the rocket, how long that that Kevlar basically how long you can stay below 40 C? Um. No, not exactly. We haven't done that yet. Okay, and I had another yeah. question on. You mentioned that you you trimmed the the petri dishes down a little bit. To yeah. Kilometers. What were they before you trimmed them down, and how do you maintain the uh, the airtight seal? I, I just don't I don't know anything about petri dishes, so I'm just curious just how, how that works. So the right. standard I, height of a petri dish is about 15 mm, and we fill it to about halfway. So that's about 7.5 millimeters. So we wanted to make sure that we have enough culture media for this uh, to be incubated overnight post the flight and all of that. So we didn't want to compromise on the volume of culture media. So we made an allowance to make sure that even though we trimmed it, we could accommodate the usual amount of culture and media. And uh, as per airtight, uh, there is a rubber gasket that makes these dishes completely airtight. So there is air inside them. And after this, they will be placed in the 37 degrees Celsius incubator afterwards. So okay. it, uh, we've tried to preserve the function of the Petri dish to the maximum extent. Super duper. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, Very well done. Yeah, fantastic presentation. Thanks a bunch. And uh, good luck in the competition. Yep, thanks a lot. Thank it's, you so much. It's really you. fun interacting with you guys. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you.